cigarettes in the same place outside the back of the AA when she was teaching in uh, DRL. So that's where we used to meet. Um, thank you for your patience. Some of you already have suffered five hours already, which is a long time from one person. Um, tonight I want to concentrate on the research agenda that grows out of the things that I showed you in, in the last uh, two days. Um, so, you should know this statement. This is from 1914, from the Futurist Manifesto, that every generation will have to build its own city. And this was meant in two ways. First, that it's a project of the imagination. And secondly, it's a social project, a collective, a collective project, that as societies transform, they will need new kinds of cities. Okay. And this is a summary diagram of a recent publication, uh, an article I published in AD. There are nine parameters there that are ways of uh, analyzing the morphology of the city. And this strange kind of thing in the middle is the mathematics of biological networks. And it seems the same kind of mathematics that works for biological networks at all scales is also applicable to the cities. Uh, none of these are originated in MTech, but we are the first to try and make the synthesis. Um, and this one, 
comes from the Institute, Santa Fe Institute of Complexity Studies and it's a mathematical expression of the logics of flow and the, of these kinds of branching networks. Um, and you've had some hours of that already, so we don't need to do more. And if you remember this from this morning, this is actually the first from the diagram from the first paper that was ever published at uh, Santa Fe Institute. Okay, and we looked a little bit at the kinds of structures, but the externalization of metabolism. How in uh, many animal societies, distributed intelligence and structure and architecture go together, and they always are linked to externalizing uh, metabolic function. And of course humans are the same. Biologists have studied this for 150 years and there's a great deal of writing about it and humans and human architecture has not been studied uh, from this point of view. And we looked at some of these and we looked at... We also, I touched a little bit on the evolution of urban uh, textures or morphology. And in the book there are uh, two sets of uh, examples that go from a single cell to the first uh, urban patterns. And the same, this one from Mesopotamia and this one from China. And I also mentioned a little bit about how the social logic of privacy and later the rules of religious um, separations and congregations, how these evolved at the same time in the same place as the cities evolved. It's not that the religion came first or the city came first. These are always co-evolutions. Okay. And many of these textures uh, we can still find today and half an hour on Google Earth and you'd be amazed at how many places in the world you can find very, very ancient uh, patterns in the city. Cities have never been singular artifacts. Nowadays we're used to the idea because we're a city we think is disassociated from its place. But cities have always been linked into networks. Even the tiniest and most ancient never existed solely by themselves. And there are various hierarchies in the linkages and I showed some topological analysis this morning and diagrams to explain that. And most of you will be familiar with these. Part of your inheritance in Barcelona. Okay. So, there we go, that's 5,000 years in less than five minutes. Um, where are we now? What I want to run through is the sets of ideas about cities for uh, approximately the last hundred years and then to show in some detail the current research and our research agenda for the design and development of new cities. Okay. That's a uh, quotation we've already seen. There's been a dream that's both utopian and dystopian for the last hundred years. We can find evidence for this, not just in architectural books. In fact, you will find the least amount of evidence in architectural books. You'll find a great deal of evidence in novels, in poems, in films, and in paintings. And in our work, we regard these as a kind of index that allows us to make a more scientific analysis. <coughs> We're not making scientific analysis of films, but we find recurrent themes. Utopia, as you will know in your theory classes, is an old idea. Dystopia is quite modern, and it's the fear of the city. And human societies are simultaneously able to hold the dream and desire for a city and the fear of it, in the same time. Okay. Two components. Again, this is something we've covered quite a lot in the last uh, sessions about all complex systems have 
a very few components. They have millions and millions of them, but very few different kinds. And it's the relationship between them that's significant. Mostly you might think in contemporary terms, what you design in your studio, or what I see out here are kind of super blocks or towers. And you might think of that as being very contemporary. But actually this kind of dream, this kind of thinking in architecture starts uh, a little bit before this actually, um, probably Santilia. But these are the first examples where we see it organized into a city uh, tissue. This is Hilbersheimer. At this time, a European, a socialist, and he's designing and proposing these enormous blocks. He's designing a city for one million people. Um, I'm sure in your studio you're going to be doing something similar. But even in, in this early time, we can start to see the principal sets of ideas. Some kind of public uh, flow space. These things rather sweetly uh, motor cars. Nothing like Barcelona today. It is kind of crazy thing. But generally this kind of layering of the public space, the service space is underneath, and all the people living uh, in these massive blocks. The blocks themselves are huge. 600 by 100 meters, five stories uh, below the uh, table. As you can see in the little section there, maybe if they're around here. And almost no differentiation in the tissue. So this is an intensely kind of modernist idea. Just an endless <coughs> expanse. There's no boundary to this. There's no sense of having a center. There is only this kind of endless logic um, of the com compacting people together and organizing it around a system of flow. More or less the same time, Corbusier wants to do something bigger, of course, because he's French. He wants to have you know, three million people, but pretty much you can see this as a similar kind of figure. There's the model. Out here is where we would be. This is for the workers and the peasants. Only the elite are going to live in the towers. And the little white patch you see in the middle, very nicely and kind of quite um, impossibly, is the airport. But again, the central kind of logic that's controlling the geometry is the system of movement and transportation. Airports, major roads, and these kind of uh, principal axes. And of course it's towers and super blocks and flow systems. And by 1925 is much more explicit. This is actually being paid for by a motor car company, which is where it's called Wassin, um, named after the automobile uh, uh, for a segment of Paris. Most of you who've been to Paris will recognize a little bit of the um, uh, plan of the city. This amazing image is taken from a 1930 film. The film doesn't really exist anymore. There's some fragments left. It's a model, like most of these models made by architectural students. And pretty much what you think of as the contemporary city is fully there, 1930. Massive systems of flow, great towers of light, commercial enterprises, uh, vertical separation, and lateral separation of various kinds of people and programs. More famously, most of you will know this image, right? Metropolis. <coughs> the story of Met Metropolis, fewer people remember, but it's worth thinking about it um, because it also tells you something about our relation to society at large. There is um, an evil dictator who runs the city. There's also the person who designed and built it, and he's an architect. And this figure reoccurs in the dystopian dream right through the 20th century. And I'm going to show you in one or two small uh, images uh, in, um, in more recent times in the 21st century. And there's the model. 
1930s, almost no work at all in America, lots of architectural graduates, probably, um, I don't know if this kind of current recession is as bad as they say it's going to be. Some of you are going to be working on film sets or <laughs> buildings. Um, and there they are, uh, making and working on the model. And I think I really like this guy right up in the back there. Um, okay. Probably a more prophetic film, but also not so well known, is The Shape of Things to Come. And in this film you can see these kind of very large uh, spaces, urban spaces that we're more used to now. They kind of where aggregations of solitude. They're the kinds of spaces that the French anthropologist Marc Auger called non-place. Non they could be anywhere. In his analysis, Marc Auger is contemporary of course, um, there's an element of transaction. You have, to, you have to buy the right to be in it, like entering a supermarket or an airport ticket. Um, so these are the spaces of transit become the major public spaces of the city. And we're not so far from that now. Along with the dream of the metropolis is the idea of the garden city, about the same age. Starts a little bit uh, in England and Germany, uh, around about the same time as the images I've shown you. Um, um, it, it's, we're going to see several examples and then a moment of transition. But in principle, it, it's a completely extended landscape with only uh, natural boundaries of topography as its limitation. And the most famous one, early one, is Frank Lloyd Wright. This is 1932, Broadacre City. A political statement for the Americans that every man, and uh, nowadays they'd say every person, but every man should have his own acre. And these acres, these small areas, are organized programmatically with, in a kind of carpet that can extend endlessly. And Frank Lloyd Wright is also arguing that this kind of the governance of this should also be by an architect. The only person who's suitable to be the ruler and organizer of these domains to design it and to build it uh, is the architect. But it has a number of interesting characteristics. First of all, it puts forward a kind of political idea that's in opposition to industrialization. It's a kind of idealization of human existence where you could grow all your own food or in collaboration with your neighbors you could be um, self-sufficient. It's an agrarian society, an endless plain. The curious thing, although it's in opposition, its principal organization is exactly the same as the metropolis. It's the architecture of flow. It's the axes and distribution system that organizes the landscape. Um, but, you know, it has some kind of attractive features for some people. It also, in my view and in my argument, comes ex from exactly the same kind of thought. That all of nature is human, humans have dominion over nature. Nature by itself is irrelevant. It's just there for humans to build over, to tame and to marshal and bring together. And we'll see later on some of the consequences of, of that kind of thinking. Okay. Um, a little bit later, by the 40s, Hilbert Simon is now an American and a capitalist. <coughs> Um, good American, he actually did very, very good work on the master plan for Chicago, most famously in America. Um, he's regarded as um, a significant urbanist. He hasn't completely abandoned the super block. He's just kind of recontextualized it into uh, a landscape carpet. And when you look at the more detail of the drawings, the big blocks are still there. Not so many of them, but they're still organized along the principal axes of flow. 
and the territories that surround it, these are uh, the little settler houses, um, and there too are organized into uh, grids. In both cases, there's a kind of machinic logic. We'll see a little later some of the tissues that we're currently studying of evolved cities that are quite different in their appearance and their patterns and their spaces than, than these. It's my duty as your dean to say you'll never become an architect. I am an architect. Okay, that's the whole story of the Fountainhead. <laughs> okay. um, but actually in America this was an extremely important book and people are still arguing and talking about it today. From our point of view, uh, the protagonist is an extremely handsome uh, architect, Howard Rock, um, who will not compromise, that doesn't uh, allow his clients to uh, dictate the shape of his building, and when they hire um, somebody else to modify uh, the tower that he designed, in the middle of the night he creeps into the building site with dynamite and he blows up the building. Um, this is a kind of turning point, not necessarily the film itself, but the novel discusses the role of the individual in society. And the romantic dream of the architect as a kind of soul hero battling against culture, refusing to compromise, is epitomized by this film. It's not invented by Anne Rand or by the filmmakers. It's an idea that's at large in society. And much of our legacy in schools has been inherited from this kind of logic. Okay. So all of those ideas are coming together more or less at the same time. A very great uh, English writer, mainly a science fiction writer, J.G. Ballard, wrote a short story, I think this one, um, The Garden City is its title, I think it's about 1970. And it marks a kind of transition, another important transition. Ballard was imagining and writing about a society that was completely <laughs> agrarian. A kind of highly high-tech version of a uh, broadacre city where everybody lives in an agrarian society, but a very, very high-tech one. It's all uh, bicycles and wind pumps and solar panels, and everything is very civilized. Um, and life is, um, shall we say, lived uh, as a kind of sustainable dream. And the young protagonist, the young hero, Holloway, hates it. He's 17 years old, he's grown up in the system, and what he dreams about is the city, the nearby abandoned city. And what he dreams about is reanimating it, rewiring it. And he visits it and gradually he and a number of other young people move there and they reconnect um, all the wiring and they realize that the city is only alive from its noise and its light. And he does this, and he finds within this city a single character, the original architect called uh, Buckmaster, who still lives there. And what he's saying is, in a certain sense, the city is only alive when, it's act when there's some evidence of it being active. There are deeper re readings and more significant meanings, and we can talk about that a, a little bit later. But this is, becomes a very common theme in novels and films from about 1970 onwards. These are not films written by architects or novels or theoreticians. They're just a kind of index of what society at large is thinking. This is a quotation uh, from Ballard again. But the presence of, uh, in the novel of these kind of abandoned cities becomes more and more powerful. And in the end, it becomes to dominate the, the dreams of the young. 
Okay. Most of you will know this image, right? Yeah. I am. Um, I am Legion. I think is a film quite recent, five or six years old. For of course, all U.S. films seems to always feature New York as the abandoned city. I don't know how they manage to film it, but they do. Um, and it's a recurrent uh, and very powerful image. In case we have too much of a romantic dream of cities, we should start to think about where cities are being built extremely rapidly, in many cases without much urban design and certainly without many architects. Um, and they're being built rapidly, not out of greed, but a population pressure, which is in the Far East. In China, uh, parts of Malaysia, and Singapore, Korea, Japan, all of that part of the world is in Indonesia, enormously and very rapidly expanding populations. And this is the reality. Towers, very close together, very little uh, what we would think of as uh, design intention. This is a typical design drawing, something you might have done in first year or second year. Your tutors are never going to give you a degree if you do this. There they are. <coughs> and that journey from those very simple drawings to that is extremely short. And it's getting shorter. In parts of China, they say they can build a 60-story tower from the drawing board to the last person opening uh, the door of their apartment in less than two years. You try to do that in London, it's six to eight years. That's after you get planning permission. I don't know what the story is here, but I'm guessing fairly similar. So there, as I said this morning, there are two kind of projects at work here. There's the problem of the reworking or the rewiring of the existing mature cities. But the major project in the world that's happening without much input from us as architects and urbanists is the making of new cities and often in <coughs> very uh, extreme or difficult biomes, difficult climates. Nonetheless what they're building is what you would recognize pretty much from any European city from the 1970s. So m not much advance in design. This is what's become a broad acre city. The acre for every person has become the quarter acre plot and the flow organization, the architecture of that infrastructure separates completely the domains of people living on either side. If you happen to live there or there, you have to drive several miles to move from there to there. In some cases, most famously, um, in the book Edge City, it's 14 kilometers in order to cross a road. These are immense systems. Uh, in a way, they're so immense they have a kind of beauty and power of their own. But they're entirely for only one uh, uh, mode of transportation, one movement. And <coughs> if you're not from there, your worst nightmare is trying to drive through it. If you grew up there or you live there, you're fine. But anyway, I challenge any one of you, if you go there and you don't know where you're going, this is a nightmare. Um, and actually there's a very nice, uh, interesting novel about that called Concrete Island by J.G. Ballard, which is simply about a man who has a small accident with his car and gets isolated in one of these small patches in the middle of one of these systems. Um, And there they are. Amazing things, in some ways, in others, truly horrifying. We have also, um, this is now demolished, but I saw this as a child, and anyone who grew up in Hong Kong or the Far East will know about this. Uh, the walled city known as the City of Darkness. It had, as far as we know, the highest density of humans ever achieved in an urban block. 
this is what it looked like from part of the, part of the interior um, it's still studied even though it's gone there are still architects studying this and one of the reasons they study it is for the informal networks of movement that built up at very different levels that connected by small uh, walkways, <coughs> by apartments that were partially demolished and became uh, little servant spaces. Um, and in fact, if you go to Tokyo um, and uh, Hong Kong, various other places, you'll be able to find in some schools uh, some uh, detailed models of it. Okay, it's only 200 meters by just over 100 meters. 33,000 people lived there. That's a small town. That's a whole town. Um, an incredible density. And just a small bit of mass you can see. For a square kilometer, that would work out to one million people. That's like putting the whole of the center of Barcelona, which I think has a population of one million, into a block that's 200 meters by 100 meters. And the social orders that arose from that uh, were very common. There is, just to show you I'm not being uh, too romantic about the city, for a large part of the world's population, the city is just something on the horizon. There is a big cost to cities. Because everything in a city comes from somewhere else. And almost all people in cities now come from somewhere else. And this is one of the costs. A significant fraction of human society in the world lives like this. In order to support a city, there was a time when cities were closely uh, wedded, let's say, to the land around them. In China, particularly, agriculture happened inside the city walls. Here in Europe, the city had its immediate context where everything, uh, or most of their needs were, were produced. And the landscape and the urban form were one and the same system. This is not so anymore. There are very few places in the world where that relation exists. And in consequence, very large areas of the Earth's surface are engineered. And we went through some of the mathematics of why that is so uh, this morning. What is less well known is this. Very large parts of the Earth's surface are irredeemably altered. They cannot be reworked. That is the cost of this and my iPhone and my laptop and yours. The rare earths and metals that we use in all our productions leave these marks on the landscape. But they're far enough away and we never see them and we don't have to think about them. Nor do we think about this unless you live and work in one of these regions. This is what sustains us. This is what we need to be alive and to live as we are. This is the consensual map, that is the map that the least number of people, <coughs> scientists, disagree about, of the Earth systems that are at their tipping point. In more formal terms, their critical threshold, they're either on the threshold or passing through it. These are the ones that people don't argue about, uh, except a few politicians. But you can see very large areas, again, of the Earth's surface are going through an ecological change. The number and species of plants that grow in them is changing. That means the animal life on them is changing, the water resources and the temperatures are changing, and we are part of that story. We're not separate from that story. Okay. And in all systems, 
from a complexity history point of view, theory point of view, there are only three possible outcomes for a transition through a critical threshold. Only three in this theory. Dispersal, simplification and complexity. Dispersal, when we're talking about cities, means gradual loss of order and abandonment, typically in history a two to three generation process, sometimes a little longer, sometimes a lot shorter, and is always a kind of generational bias. The young people move, the old stay there. People tend to move short distances. Uh, it's called demic uh, expansion or demic waves. Um, and there's a great deal of archaeological and anthropological evidence for it. Simplification, I explained this morning that what we call um, sustainability nowadays. Only one example in the whole of human history, which is the eastern half of the Roman Empire. Um, and they did that by shrinking their territory, by going from 30 million people down to less than one million and one city, uh, Istanbul. And this is what I'm advocating. This is where successful transitions of human societies have happened in the past is reordering and that is always coupled to a higher flow of energy and a higher flow and more quantity of information. Societies that got more complex survived and prospered and spread. Those that didn't, who got it wrong, ended like this. This was once a great city, in those days what was thought to be a great city, on what was then the superhighway. It was a city on the Silk Road that connected uh, China all the way down to Venice and then up into Europe. Climate change, deforestation, all the stuff you read about now that is kind of a bit boring to think about and you know maybe it's someone else's problem. This is absolutely what the result will be. In disciplines outside our own, this is not controversial. Archaeologists, anthropologists, climatologists all study these things. It's all known data. And we have some other examples, more famously Chernobyl, still fascinating. You know they have tourists here? It is, yeah. There's not quite as many people as come to Barcelona, but you can take a holiday and, and, and book a holiday and go on a nice trip to Chernobyl. Yeah. And people go in uh, tens of thousands. Um, I, haven't, I haven't been yet, but uh, if the senior partner will allow, one, one day soon we shall go on a visit. Okay. I'd like to share a revelation that I've had during my time here. It came to me when I tried to classify your species, and I realized that you're not actually mammals. Every mammal on this planet instinctively develops a natural equilibrium with the surrounding environment, but you humans do not. You move to an area and you multiply and multiply until every natural resource is consumed. And the only way you can survive is to spread to another area. There is another organism on this planet that follows the same pattern. Do you know what it is? A virus. The human beings are a disease, a cancer of this planet. You are a plague. And of course, he is pure information. Okay. Okay. So, I am not an advocate of sustainability. I think sustainability generally <coughs> suffers. It's more like a theology than a science. It's acts of faith. There's little evidence that it can work. What I'm advocating is studying the science of cities, gaining a deeper understanding of natural processes and the mathematics of that, <coughs> coupling those to the design of cities. 
and I'm also advocating that we have good uh, science relations outside of the small professional world of architecture and urbanists. And I'm going to show you a little bit about that. If the UN is right for your generation, this will be the most significant area of work that will happen in your professional lifetime. 2,000 new cities. Never been a time in human history where so much will need to be built in such a short time. Okay, so how do we find the research for that? Well, as I started to say uh, in the earlier seminars, we're looking at surfaces and branching networks. This is kind of comes from the biological, the mathematics of biological understanding of metabolism. And we have both traditional and new ways of examining those. This nice little drawing, not made by architects, made by climate scientists. Climate scientists is a particular branch of climate science, which they call themselves urban climatologists. This is the way they now categorize the city as a series or as a certain differences on the surface. And they have very good kind of mathematics and they're able to, uh, I think I have a table there. This has been tested on two cities in Japan, both measured and projective calculations, and they're beginning to be able to calibrate this very accurately. And you can see um, it's, I won't go in detail between all of these. These are a lot less scary than they look. The problem with mathematics is it's got all these funny symbols, but once you know what the symbols mean, the logic is fairly straightforward. And you might be more familiar, this is our reworking, trying to explain those to ourselves, what that actually means in terms of urban textures. So there are nine parameters we work there with. And we also work with topological systems, which are ways of mapping independently of geometry. Great advantage there is you need the geometry on this side, but you also need to understand movement and connection and you need to free your mind from the physical geometry and think about the spaces and their connections. Topology is a very powerful branch of mathematics. This and this is a representation of a whole urban patch in a city, uh, traditional city uh, texture in China. And you can measure intensities and you can measure the flow from nodes and connections. And that brings us to that, which I introduced at the beginning. And all of this is uh, amenable, as the scientists say, that means it's possible in not too difficult way for computational simulation. This is, most of you would recognize, a very simple uh, CA. Each one of these is, this is in, towards the design of a new kind of agrarian city, a distributed city where the proximity of the dwelling and the productive land surface, there is a second characteristic which comes in a minute, can be carefully mapped. You can simulate this in a different way. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, yesterday and this morning. Simulations are when you set up an initial set of rules. In effect, you're designing a process, and then you run it and see what the outcome is. Then you need the other kind of mathematics I showed you to evaluate that outcome. So this is the way we're working. These tools are what we use for evaluation. These are the beginnings of tools, and I'll show some more complex ones, where we produce, we design a process, as biology and natural systems do, as the genome does. Human genome, the same as any other living genome, describes a process and not an artifact. So we take that kind of computational logic from that. And by running, uh, we can run multiple examples. They can all run on a laptop. 
It's another one of our constraints that we're not uh, working in some strange uh, language or with supercomputers. Super we're looking with very fast and efficient, computationally efficient algorithms. Okay, it's what a mathematician would call elegant. It's the smallest description you can make of a process that uses the least amount of processing power. It's a very important kind of paradigm. There's no point in trying to develop a killer script if it's going to crash your laptop or if only two computers in the world can run it. Anyway, these are the simulations. By varying the factors of attractiveness, we can produce large amounts when we can match uh, urban densities and we can use our analytical tools on the various kinds of clusters and the overall relationships. Okay. And we can select out some pieces, make our evaluation. Sometimes they produce amazingly interesting things. Quite a lot of the time they produce junk. And again, this is an important lesson from evolution that it's your environment you have to design and your kill strategies. Humans are really good at killing. This is, we should be very good at this. But the kill strategy in any evolutionary system is the moment of your greatest creativity. What it is you choose to breed, what it is you choose to discard. We can analyze that. We can write short scripts that produce multiple sections. Um, kind of looks interesting, but it's not terribly useful. What becomes useful then is how do you test something like this? This was a uh, competition winner. It was done by uh, two master's students for um, a New York site, uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And it's run uh, and tested on that. And what came out of that are what might seem to be kind of unusual or odd or just eccentric urban configurations. But nonetheless, these are not designed. These are truly emergent. There are modes we have for beginning to nudge certain algorithms towards the kind of solutions that we need. But these match or exceed patterns of density that are achieved in more traditional urban fabrics. We also have another branch of studies that we're making where we're analyzing evolved urban tissues. That's not to say they're not designed, but they're not designed um, in the way that some of the earlier design processes I've showed you. Their process is a very slow aggregation and change, sometimes over centuries. And at the moment we're still working, we have quite a big collection. Um, it's not too difficult to do. We um, are using the same kind of dimensions of urban patches that the climatologists do. We haven't yet begun to correlate those two. And we're using a very limited uh, set of metrics to analyze them. Nonetheless, as part of my other argument that I presented earlier, and um, there's another value to these other than just a pattern of density or of certain spaces. The spaces themselves are People have a cultural preference for them. Not necessarily people who have been to architecture school or urbanism, but my auntie and your granny and your friends who are not architects in different countries, in different cultural inheritances, inheritances there's a preference for certain kinds of urban space and the way they're connected. And this has not been extensively studied in recent years, and as far as I know, has never been computationally studied. And what part of our research at the moment from this collection is to start to write algorithms that will generate these kinds of tissues. And from that, if we can get an improved or enhanced uh, cl climatic performance, then we can match the kind of densities that we need to achieve and then we can also computationally um, match these to uh, kind of cultural objectives. This is part of our research. It's very difficult and in some sense a little bit controversial. Um, this is some of the beginnings, very simple. Uh, again, uh, CA that's coupled to 
kind of modified uh, growth system. It's not really an L system, but it's a simplified version of it. So you can start to grow tissues in this way. Very simple scripts, five or six lines sometimes, not very more, much more. But what we've become interested in, seems to be significant, is to work on the scale of the patch, not on a single building and then aggregating that not to take the approach of a typology where you design one kind of really good urban block and then vary it, vary it and propagate it out over a distance. It's the relations within a patch that we've become interested in. Partly in terms of their spatial system, how people can move and aggregate within them. Partly that we know in, from our previous ones that we can match the kinds of densities that developers and urban designers want to have and that we can get, in this case, the kind of degrees of shading that's appropriate for very high temperature arid conditions. Uh, probably this is not a very good idea in Reykjavik. Um, we can couple that to more traditional kind of analysis, in this case, uh, Ecotech, which now can be embedded in uh, Grasshopper, as most of you will know. There's a little protocol for doing that. And we can reread uh, the degrees of heat absorption uh, and kind of solar flux in that. We work, as I've shown uh, this morning and yesterday, we work on the numbers, not on the rendered form. So these are kind of diagrams we produce from, uh, in a way, snapshots of the process um, to illustrate some of the examples that we've got. And this is the outcome uh, of that uh, two different series, the growth system um, and uh, the distributed system. And we can also try to match from our cultural knowledge or cultural analysis, the degrees and percentages of interior space that uh, we could be categorized either as semi-public or, or private. And um, this is another more familiar to some of you, space syntax, most of you will know about that. Space syntax is uh, a mathematically very elegant and simple system. What it does in its earliest day, you would take a map of the city and you would draw a line down the center of every street and you would then end up with a kind of network plan. And what the analysis does is show you which bits are best connected, which have the highest number of connections and which had the lowest number. And then in the initial days through this it didn't reveal very much, but sometimes it shows what you think are kind of well connected and well designed sequences of spaces um, are not so good. This tool is actually extensively used by people designing airport concourses and particularly uh, large supermarkets. Uh, but still many uh, urbanists do it. This is our version, our new one. Uh, it's a Rhino script. It's a similar kind of logic. But what it's doing is using a top map, trying to map, uh, extract a topological analysis from uh, a geometrical model. So you can see if we dissolve away the blocks, what we're left with are nodes and connections. And the mixture of those two is very interesting. Uh, this is a simple Rhino script. This is done in Rhino uh, without Grasshopper. Um, quite straightforward in a way. In this case, the growth pattern for the canals, the branching network of the canals, is coupled to the density models. So as the canals branch, the various patches, that there is an overall ambition for total density. There's an overall ambition for a variation in density but nothing is specific to a location. In other words, when you're designing the process, you can say I want 20% um, of the city to be very high density tall. We need 60% to be kind of low to medium density, and we will allow various other kind of pockets or gradations between them. So it's the gradation of density becomes the significant computational logic. And again, you can run this every time you run it, you get a slightly different result. And um, the 
two students who did it were so impressed they kind of stopped and said, isn't this amazing? It looks wonderful. But the next step in this uh, process is to apply the analytical tools and couple them back to, to this process. Okay, this was uh, quite recent last year. And I'm going to show you some of those tools in use in uh, an evolutionary algorithm. In this case, there's a little map of the algorithm, the same one, or an adapted one from the one I showed uh, yesterday. The overall logic of the process. And in this case, we're just using uh, a few of those criteria to analyze uh, the small pieces uh, uh, of urban tissue that are produced. The process of producing them, again, is a very simple primitive, shall we say, simple idea of a block. This is for uh, the Mekong River. So the precedent studies for this were Angkor Wat uh, and a number of um, what in Chinese would call uh, hydroville, <coughs> cities of water. The problem they have in the valley um, is that they have a six meter difference between uh, flood water and the dry season. And like the Angkor Wat, the great civilization, what they need to do is capture that water. It's very precious because they need to irrigate the land. They need to hold the water. Those of you who know anything about Angkor Wat, you will know, uh, but you can Google it and still find many of these kind of great urban structures, enormous kind of tanks and reservoirs that, that, and lakes. Um, but this is a very simple uh, evolutionary logic. You can see down here kind of simpler explanation. And what that's doing is relating uh, the block to the containment of water, and that water would be released into the agricultural land. Um, and this is some of it. And this is where, as designers, you have to learn to work here and not on the image. But most of you, your generation, are more uh, comfortable with this. Um, for my generation, it's kind of a big shock and a big change. Okay. And then you're able to generate uh, through running several generations a number of patches or pieces of territory which in themselves, in abstract, have the degree of functionality you want. The problem you have is you don't know that if you put these together that there's going to be a good result. So this is uh, part of the uh, principal idea of the sections. And the idea is, in this particular case, that the city had two particular profiles, wet season and dry season. It turns out actually to be a very ancient idea. And there's some archaeological evidence that cities in those regions, uh, people just moved. to They had a, a winter city and a summer city. In this case, they're in the same place. And they're spatially separated. And so you would have different connections and routes uh, in the wet season when the water was high and as the water was released um, you would have uh, what would emerge uh, new sets of connections and spaces. In order to make this work and to place these and to design the city you need to understand the dynamics of flow of water in the valley. This is a big river valley. This mode of analysis is becoming increasingly common uh, in architecture and for uh, engineers, land engineers particularly, vector analysis is, has a much longer history than uh, we have used it for. Okay. And then you can couple your growth to those flow logics and to the topography. Again, this is a small growth algorithm that's beginning to give uh, principal roots that those in themselves would start to provide the network of spaces of connectivity and allow you to place um, this kind of new uh, urban artifact. At the moment, these valleys of the Mekong are occupied by uh, very small numbers of people uh, in a very traditional way that they kind of live in boats on uh, the wet season and in the summer season they kind of move out to, to these territories. 
but there is an incredible population pressure. Almost everybody, a very high percentage of people of the regional population is aged under 30, and um, there's a logical consequence of that. I don't need to explain the, the mechanism. Uh, but in this case, this was uh, one of our first kind of water metabolisms. Um, so we were working on two ends of water metabolism, one in very arid systems and one in really wet systems. And someone spoke to me this morning from Bangladesh, I think. Um, and this Bangladesh has exactly the same kind of problem. How do you build a city that's going to be flooded for guaranteed to be flooded every year for many months of the year. You can't keep water out. You can't get rid of it forever. You have to incorporate it, and this is part of our strategies, to incorporate it into the very fabric of the city itself. Okay. So, I want to leave you with two questions and one image. Can we, in the mature city, can we reanimate it somehow? Can we recapture our audience? Architects and urbanists, by and large, are not well respected or well thought of in, in society at large. Do we have a dream of how we can reorder and reinvent existing mature cities? And particularly, can we think of an infrastructure that doesn't separate it integrates public spaces and natural ecologies within the city fabric. And the two images I want to leave you with are these. One from the, again from the 1970s, uh, an American, um, but he was kind of loosely attached to um, the metabolis of Japan. And uh, an image here which many would uh, I think it was Kenzo Tangi, but it isn't. It was actually a real proposal, never built, for uh, East Manhattan uh, superhighway. But as you can see, it has a few kind of, um, I can find my mouse, I can't find my mouse, but there are a few little trees in there. There's a huge amount of space given to these, what seem to be overscaled enormous cars. There's only a tiny bit for the railway, but it's inhabited. There are apartments, there are public spaces, there's a very vestigial, just an idea of a park of some kind. So there are at least four, what we think of as infrastructural systems, in, embedded into one. In our work, we're studying seven systems, and we're thinking about how we can incorporate them into a singular artifact. And you have more experience of this than, than we do, but arguably, public spaces still have a very si great significance in cities. You, if you're an inhabitant here, you may or may not, you may regret uh, the kind of tourism of, of this. But there's a reason why people from all over the world come here. Because there are fewer and fewer spaces like this in the world. Increasingly very few. For most European and dense Asian cities, the only public spaces are spaces of transit, the big airports, the big supermarkets. There are some still parks, but they're always separate. Can this and this be combined? And what I want to leave you with is a final question. Does the city serve us, or do we serve the city? And I think for your younger generation, who I hope are going to be the ones designing and building the 2,000 cities of the future, you need to hold this question very close to you. Thank you. Question for for Mike. You? <laughs> Any question? Um, I'm 
ไปพักโอเค Um, it's funny that you ended your lecture with this question because I have been keeping this question all through your lectures to ask, and I was waiting to see how it all ended up. Yeah. Um, uh, it because you started uh, your lectures with uh, biology and uh, genetics and systems and and um, the metabolics of systems in nature uh, and this idea of symbiosis. Um, and mm, then you moved on to cities, and the problem. And uh, this morning also, you said something about how everything has become so highly specialized that we have no idea where things come from and how things are made. And before, everybody knew how to make a house, but now nobody can unless you're an architect. Yeah. But um, so with these ideas of specialization in our cities, even um, we have uh, all. Um, areas completely specialized for what is going to happen in that area. So we have roads, and cars are going in the roads, and then next door we have the sidewalk, and then we have these things that are moving constantly, which are the people and the cars and the bikes. But then we have these elements that are are permanent, which are the buildings. And with these differences, how can we achieve okay. this? <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, I understand the question. First of all, uh, all cities are continuously being rebuilt, so it's. The shortness of attention span that makes us think there are systems of movement and there are things that are static and forever. And even in my uh, 40 years since I first came to Barcelona, I've seen huge differences. When you look at ancient cities, most parts of the city, uh, particularly in um, the kind of climates that I was talking about this morning, the principal material was sun-dried brick and it lasts for 80 years. There's nothing you can do to make it last longer. So, we need to understand cities operate on a very different time scale to biological systems. Nonetheless, the same kind of uh, analysis is important. The reason there are ancient buildings still in Barcelona and other cities is because people preserve them. If they weren't preserved for political or cultural reasons, of course they would decay and be gone and be rebuilt. So the time scale is very different. The second thing is the uh, lesson from biology of looking at metabolic systems. One of the things I pointed out, there's almost no science of urban metabolism. Actually the phrase itself is 50 years old and there have been people who started to think about that. But it needs, if you think about the number of people who've done biological science in the last 50 years, it's you know several orders of magnitude difference and the volume of money. And for architects, again, our problem generally is we have a problem about doing research. If you're in practice, you have a building to do and you hope to learn something on that building, it's kind of advancing your knowledge and you can reapply it somewhere else later on. So, um, architecture schools, there's no such thing as an R&D department anywhere in the world for architecture. There are beginning to be very big EU and National Science Foundation in America grants to study urban metabolism. The first one was granted by the NSF for two million dollars last year, the first one ever given to an architect. Uh, she's working at Berkeley and she's working on part of the material of cities that's uh, a kind of metabolic study, but at, at a material level. Um, it's an immensely difficult and huge task, and it's beyond the capacity of one person or a group of people. It's a kind of project, as the future has said, it's a project of the imagination for a whole society. We also have a kind of legacy from let's say the early excitement of the days of the motor car. And I don't know if it's true in Spain or in Barcelona in particular, but in England, traffic planners, the guys who design and plan roads, have a superior function on the form of a city to urban designers and to architects. They come first. Generally, the roads are built and then the thing is filled in. And there's a very famously a city in northern Nigeria where you know you can do it on Google Earth and I have uh, former students who've been there and all the roads are laid out. 
And in England, the most famous example was Milton Keynes, which had an amazing first concept of uh, integrated infrastructure where the buildings and the central crossings of the road network were to be integrated into the same thing. Traffic planners said no. And they built all the roads. And when I was young, you could go to Milton Keynes and you could find 10 buildings and you know several kilometers in either direction of roads in a nice grid pattern. It's not just that that still happens, it's embedded in the logic of what we teach and study. It's still that urban form, you have a block, you know, and most of us when we ask to design a block in studio, we think about it, we think of when we draw the road pattern and then kind of extrude this thing up and then think about how to make it look amazing on the inside or its surfaces. So there, there's both an intellectual problem in the way we even conceive of it, and that's partly our inheritance. The other part of our inheritance, I did talk about it a little bit earlier, is typified by the, the novel and then the film, The Fountainhead. Architecture became, around about the 1950s, an inward-looking domain. And it shrank, it took to fewer and fewer people. Most architects, your friends are architects, right? Most of you. It's still a bit like that. Um, we still write and publish, and our audience for our publications is mainly architects. And we design, and the ones who say we're good architects or bad architects want to make that decision about us are mainly architects. And we've stopped looking at other sciences and disciplines. And in the book, which uh, is, uh, one or two of you may have read, Architecture of Emergence, uh, the first difficulty I had in doing that research, which took many years, was I had to re-educate myself about climate science. I had to find out what was significant body of knowledge, the seminal thinking amongst archaeologists. I had to study anthropology had to read geography. All of those things are, you know, they're out there and they're public and once you start talking to those people, they're kind of puzzled that, oh, an architect never asked me that before. In fact, most of them have never really talked to an architect, never been invited to architecture schools. They're not part of systems of study. But, on a more positive side, in order to get a grant nowadays to study cities, pretty much, you have to have some of those people in your team. And the wider you're able to make that kind of network, the more likely you are to get research funding. The ERC grants in the EU, which are uh, quite significant, encourage uh, three different disciplines to make teams, preferably in three different countries, at three different kinds of institution. You can't have even the same three kinds of university in three different places. Those are the big kind of science grants for cities. Um, so I, I am positive, despite all the doom and gloom and the images, I, I'm showing those because I think these are important transitions that society is undergoing. But I am advocating that these are moments in human history where humans have uh, reorganized to a higher level of complexity. And you know, I hope I'm helping to lay some of the foundations for why we should be doing that and where we should be looking for uh, collaborations and where we should be working. And, you know, I love studio too, but the dream in the studio, the moment of genius of you by yourself redesigning this uh, to other people is ludicrous. The, you know, that's just not a kind of recognizable way. If you talk to people who design computers, you know, there's no solitary genius. Maybe jobs, they will say. But they thought he was a genius because he could organize great teams. And he could see it from a concept all the way through to production and to market. Now, we don't have anything like that at the moment in architecture. And that's kind of what I'm advocating. Not that we become the journey to market kind of thing, but we're collaborative, we're open, we share our knowledge, we try and engage other disciplines, we use their knowledge, which mostly they give freely. They're just pleased to be asked. Yeah. 
and perhaps the more deeply and more passionately I believe this is significant for your generation, the most significant contribution that architecture can make to the future of the world. So that's a slightly mad rant, a, a very civilized question. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. Yeah, um, I was just wondering when, when, when you showed us your research agenda, how in the end, but I, I'm not an architect and I have architect friends okay. and I agree with right. a lot of what you say. <laughs> and one of the things I always sort of realize in that relation is that uh, Architects tend to be in another planet, <laughs> a different <laughs> one, and they design for another planet. Yeah. And when I was thinking of that, I was thinking of like the way you, you, you do the research, and I was wondering, a lot of the research and, and the way you do simulations and stuff, it's, it's all related to a lot of phys physical conditions. There's yeah. also a thing about, there's a sort of a <laughs> slight sort of touch in the world of culture and and the anthropology, but when I think of cities, I always think that they're all just a result of political decisions. And it's uh, basically kind of one person, like it's, it's, the, it's the sum of one person's decision. No, uh, somebody decided to make this road so it could have its name, and, and then somebody else decided to do this building, and that's what people remember of cities, and that's what people who are not architects see in cities yeah. and, and, and in the end, is there, do you think there's a way that this kind of research that you do can like really get into this sort of, I don't know, political simulation of how things are going to change, react or... Yeah, um, in contemporary society, politicians delay things. They have a short attention span. Uh, just like directors of schools, uh, normally of five years. I'm not sure what, what it is here, but in most of Europe it's five years. You're elected for five years. Um, so your scope of projects you want to do, unless you're a complete uh, megalomaniac, are kind of small adjustments. Um, but we shouldn't accept that as a reason for not doing things. And by and large, through history, the bulk of actions, although they may have been occasionally initiated by politicians, by and large they weren't. Now politicians, being what they are, if something amazing is happening and I'm a politician, I'm going to stand here and say, of course, it's my idea. I started this, all these wonderful people here, they all owe me a great vote of thanks. So politicians are actually less effective than you might think when you look at the historical scale. Um, and we see how social pressures, um, when you do these kinds of it, longer historical analysis, generate uh, vast cities. Of course there are always the rich, both the corporate rich and the politically rich, rich in terms of power, who will want to leave their mark. And architects traditionally have always been servants of the rich. Um, Nothing I, neither good nor bad about that situation. That, that is, there's always somebody who pays for an individual building. But the dream of the city is much wider than any politician. And we've seen political changes in the last year from the Arab Spring, Berlusconi, um, I don't know what's going to happen here, but they say Spain is going to be next, uh, Greece and Spain, that eventually if social pressures build, they cannot be stopped. You, you need an army and you need eventually to just kill everyone. Yeah. You, but when there's a real social pressure, you just cannot stop it. What happens in China, the great kind of liberations that happened in China are simply a result of expanding population. And uh, kind of controlling powers there have been a lot smarter than in other parts of the world. But still, you know, they are holding back kind of social changes. But 
you know, everybody makes fun of things like Twitter and Facebook and uh, emails and so forth. But that can never be undone and it can't be repressed. And there's a great uh, saying from my generation, great inspiration for people like me, information wants to be free. There's another part which we don't often talk about, uh, it also wants to be expensive, but uh, information wants to be free. If we develop these kinds of knowledges, then there won't be any way to repress it or undo it. And the changes will happen regardless of whether politicians want them to or not. They are simply, I mean we did, went through some of the mathematics, the biological mathematics this morning and yesterday, there are simply too many people in the world for this not to happen. And by and large, humans are more or less ethical, not completely. We all do things we don't really approve of ourselves. <coughs> but more or less, humans at large tend to behave in a social collective. And that's their biological history. And there's also another great saying um, by a French ant anthropologist Levi Strauss that a town or a city embeds within its walls its biological history. And I, I believe this to be absolutely true. Its biological history is, as we've shown a little bit, and I've done it in uh, a whole book about it, so it's kind of hard to get 100,000 words down into a few sentences and an answer. But we have evolved um, metabolically to be social creatures and although we compete with each other at a certain level most of our activities are collective. We can't exist as individuals. There's also a very kind of strange correlation to that that architecture has become a discipline where we design an individual object independently of what's around it. Now, buildings originate as a kind of externalization of metabolism. There's no such thing in any biological system of an individual that's completely independent of its environment or its context. Nonetheless, around the world, the dominant mode of thinking about individual buildings is to design the best, most beautiful, curvy uh, thing you can do, and never mind the relation of, around it. Well, I've seen out here beginning to a very nice kind of study of looking at relations between six uh, urban blocks. Um, and we still think of cities like that. There are still people designing cities who are designing the city as though it has no ecology, it doesn't have a landscape around it, it doesn't have a climate, it could be in uh, Delhi or uh, Basra or in Reykjavik, uh, it could be you know, in Finland or in Chile. It's still kind of a nice morphological object. It's got its systems and its mathematics. But generally, that's approach. And by the way, I don't know if it's true here, but in England, uh, urban planners, that's not the urbanists who design, but the ones who regulate, they work with crayons. Their principal mode of thinking are large drawings with colored in patches. So, you know, the kind of regulatory stuff is as dumb as hell. And, you know, part of our job is to kind of reinvent that, to recapture what used to be what architects did. But it's only in modern times, only the last hundred years or so, that architects became separate from those kind of, that way of thinking and that way of designing. Mike, if you're okay, we will continue the questions uh, with a few drinks with you. Oh, that would be very nice. Very good. Thank you very much for coming. Okay. Basta.